Welcome to Headline Buster, brought to you by The Point. I'm Liu Xin. In this series, I dissect stories that are making headlines around the world and talk to my guests to compensate for the missing pieces of the puzzle. So join us in real time by sending us your comments or questions via the CGTN page on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube or Weibo. If you're watching this live on the CGTN application, email us at thepointwithalex at cgtn.com. Let me know what you think. We start our live streaming every Friday at 11 a.m. Beijing time. So get in touch and we just might read out your comments. Last week, we talked about the new national security law for Hong Kong. Here are some messages from our viewers. From Alan Lowe, the hypocrisy of those countries criticizing Hong Kong national security laws are so blindly blatant. Why don't they ever condemn the treatment of black lives in the U.S., U.K., France and other countries? Why don't they ever condemn U.K. how much freedom they had given to Hong Kong pre-1997? From Musa Kaloko, there is not a state without a national law which helps the citizens to live in peace and harmony. The U.S. is meddling into Hong Kong political issues with China is just a way to infiltrate into China's sovereignty. And finally, from Danny Long, why would Hong Kongers give up first-class citizenship to become second or third-class citizens in U.K., U.S. or Australia and subject themselves to racism and discrimination? It's baffling. Well, many thanks to all our viewers for sharing with me your thoughts. Keep them coming, please. Now, the United States has just announced sanctions and visa restrictions in response to so-called ongoing human rights violations and abuses in Xinjiang. So this week, we're looking at Xinjiang, especially recent media coverage on alleged forced birth control against ethnic minorities. An AP report published on June the 29th claims the Chinese government is taking measures to cut birth rates among Uyghurs and other minorities as part of a campaign to curb its Muslim population. China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs has called the accusations groundless. Before we get to our media critique, some context first. Now, family planning was first introduced in China in the 1970s. It has been the shared responsibility of citizens and the whole society to help lift quality of life more rapidly by limiting the number of newborns. In order to preserve ethnic diversity, however, ethnic minorities, including the Uyghur people, had always enjoyed preferential population policies. In the four decades between 1978 and 2018, for example, the Uyghur population in Xinjiang doubled from 5.6 million to 11.7 million. Besides Uyghurs, the population of each of the top five ethnic minorities in Xinjiang has more or less doubled too. In southern Xinjiang, it is common to see Uyghur families with four or even more children. In July 2017, Xinjiang adopted new measures in line with those for the rest of the country as China rolled out what's known as the second child policy. Now, Han families are allowed to have the same number of children as their Uyghur counterparts, two in the city, three in the countryside. Yet, increased educational levels and socioeconomic development, just like everywhere else in the, in the world, have also resulted in lower birth rates across the board in Xinjiang. There has been significant progress in the protection of women's rights in Xinjiang in general. In 2003, the mortality rate for mothers were 163 per 100,000. By 2018, that rate had fallen to 27 per 100,000. The gender ratio in high school is basically even, boys and girls. In 19, had 3,000 ethnic minority cadres. By 2018, that number rose 143 times to 430,000. Half of them are women. But when you read recent reports on Xinjiang, many of these details have been left out. Instead, the articles opt for a narrative of imagination and speculation at best. Now, let me explain what I mean. On June the 29th, a so-called investigative report or article published by the AP put out some sensational accusations against the Chinese government regarding forced birth control in Xinjiang, allegedly targeting the Uyghur population. These 
are serious accusations on the order of genocide, as this report quotes a scholar at Newcastle University in the UK. These are direct means of genetically reducing the Uyghur population. But underneath the facade of seemingly persuasive sensationalism, there lies the usual gimmicks of bad journalism on top of a political agenda meant to spread misinformation and disinformation about the Chinese political system and leadership. The, the article claims to be based on government statistics and documents and interviews with 30 witnesses, yet it soon becomes clear that the article is mostly based on a report authored by Adrian Zenz, a German researcher who popularized the idea that one million people were locked up in Xinjiang based on accounts of only eight people. His latest report on birth rate in Xinjiang was funded by the Jamestown Foundation, a conservative think tank based in Washington, D.C. One only needs to take a quick read of his 20-odd page report in order to find well, more questions than answers. For a research report to be credible, certain academic standards should be observed. Evidence must be solid. For instance, the arguments sound, but in his report, one just stumbles a tad too often. For instance, he claims that most recently, Uyghur regions appear to conceal birth rate data, indicating its increasing sensitivity. Now, for the first time in about two decades, Kashgar Prefecture's 2019 annual report does not divulge birth, death or natural population growth rates. The reason for this is, according to Zen's apparent, Kashgar's population declined between 2018 and 2019. This could be due to out-migration. It might also be caused by extremely low birth rates. Can you believe your ears? This is apparent. Such sentences should never have been the language of a researcher. Simply because such details are missing in one annual report, could any serious scholar reach the conclusion that this must have been the result of a forced birth control campaign? Zenz was right about the population of Kashgar Prefecture declining from 2018 to 2019 from 4.63 million to 4.62 million. The difference was around 10,000 people, less than 0.2 percent. And according to my sources, the number of Han people in Kashgar actually dropped more than Uyghur people. So on what basis could he extrapolate that there was extremely low birth rates among Uyghur women only? Zenz himself couldn't exclude out-migration as a factor either. So the reason is apparent, except that he is only speculating. But sheer speculation is the least bothersome issue in Zenz's report. Next comes sheer fabrication. Zenz uses budget reports of local health commissions in various prefectures as they are obliged to be released as a common practice. Zenz tried long and hard to find bits and pieces of information in these budget reports, coupled with audacious stretches of imagination. He writes, by 2019, Xinjiang planned for over 80% of women of childbearing age in the rural southern four minority prefectures to be subjected to birth control measures with long-term effectiveness. He provided a source link, which is the Xinjiang Health Commission's budget report issued on January 29, 2019. But this sentence or such information is nowhere to be found in this budget report. In short, it doesn't take a doctoral's mind to conclude that uh, Zenz's so-called research is very problematic, unable to withstand the scrutiny in the court of law. By the way, both the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal reported a few days ago that two Uyghur exile groups filed a complaint with the International Criminal Court in The Hague for alleged persecution of Muslim minorities in Xinjiang. Remember, this is a court that the U.S. government detests profusely to the extent its Secretary of State Mike Pompeo described it as a kangaroo court. The irony of it all. Back to the AP article, aside from the shoddiness it borrows from the Zen's report, the journalists also violated basic professional rules. When quoting witnesses' account, a journalist is supposed to verify it um, at least try to do it as much as possible from a third-party perspective or at least add something like AP 
couldn't independently verify the claim. Instead, the article used these accounts to construct a fiction-like story. The sound bites they highlight are all carefully chosen to maximize emotional impact on readers. Very clever gimmicks. The 30 or so interviewees are living outside China. It's obvious what they hold as grudges against the Chinese government. They basically spoke along the same line, just as the analysts quoted in the AP article condemning the alleged practices. But out of the 19-page-long article by AP, there was not one voice from Uyghur people in Xinjiang or anybody who questions the credibility of Zensi's research. So, all in all, there you have the complete loop. Imagine, remember what I said about the, the U.S. sanction that came out just earlier today. Now, biased news reports based on shoddy research upon which policies or sanctions are rolled out. Can any country in this world swallow such accusations? According to media reports, China is considering suing Adrian Zenz for libel. We'll take a quick break and when we come back, I'll talk to my guests about the media's reaction and coverage and why it matters. Making sense of the overwhelming wave of information means cutting through the noise to shine a light on the heart of the story and making room for new perspectives. True understanding means the ability to see events from more than one side. I'm Liu Xin, and this is The Point. I'm joined by three guests. They are Liu Yunying, Associate Executive Editor and Chief Commentator of Beijing Review, Aina Tangan, current affairs commentator, and Wang Song, chief reporter with the Global Times. Good morning to all of you, and thank you for joining us. So, again, a long monologue about this report by this uh, German researcher, Adrian Zenz, and then the AP article or other article that's based on his report, and then the latest U.S. sanctions, which based, of course, not just on this particular article, but on all of the things that have been reported about Xinjiang concerning its so-called human rights violations and, and abuses. Um, this is, as I said, I, I, I see it as a kind of a loop, you know, how such policies are based and formulated. Uh, Liu Yingwing, what is your first impression that you could share with us? I mean, when I saw in this report that a weaker family can have seven children in their family, I mean, this is a huge inequality between the high majority and the, uh, weak, the minorities because in the high majority, people are currently being allowed to have two children. This is even the first time I even came to know this fact. So I am shocked too, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of things definitely from uh, many different levels and different perspectives. Uh, indeed, as I said in the very beginning of my monologue, I laid the groundwork for the family planning policy. It has been um, a basic policy of China. Basically, it played a big role, right, in the uh, development of China because uh, the number of people were quickly limited, therefore the level of uh, quality, the level of uh, living standard were um, re rising relatively, or faster, let's say, on top of the socioeconomic development that was being achieved with the hard work of the Chinese people. So that's a basic uh, national policy, that's political reality, that's socioeconomic reality of China. And yet, as you said, Liu Yuing, uh, the policy has not been even between the the Han ethnic minority and uh, the, the uh, different ethnic my the Han ethnic majority and the different ethnic minorities in China. But that that is a big background of the whole story. Now we're specifically looking at what has been happening or what has been alleged to have been happening since 2017, especially that there was this forced birth control campaign against ethnic minorities. I know. Your impression upon reading the AP report and the Adrian Zenz report that the AP report was based on? Well, I, I took a look at the sources, um, and here, here's the problem that I found. Um, if you go and take a look at who Adrian Zenz is, you, I think you'll be very interested. There's a very good article by Ajit Singh, 
and Max Blumenthal. Please uh, remember those names, and if you have any questions, go and look at their independent article. They identify that there are two organizations, uh, one, uh, one which both funded by the United States uh, through this NED, National Endowment for Democracy. Uh, this was set up after uh, the Iran-Contra affair because uh, the U.S. was doing illegal things, so they decided to bring it out in open and advocate for regime change for any country that did not have a liberal, democratic, capitalist uh, system. So let's take a look at Adrian Zenz. He is a uh, Christian evangelical, extremely conservative. He associates uh, one of his organizations as a direct descendant of a group that fought alongside the Nazis, extremely anti-Semitic. He personally does not believe that women should have equal rights. He believes in corporal punishment, e.g. that you should spank children as necessary, in his opinion. He is not friendly toward the uh, gays or lesbians. He believes it's an affront to God. He has also stated publicly that he is on a mission, quote, from God to take down the Chinese government. So let us say that any report that comes from him should be questionable. But when you dig deeper, you start to understand that these two entities, one is named the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, it was started in 1984. The other one is the Group Network of Chinese uh, Human Rights Defenders. Both of these groups, as I said, financed by the US government, were the ones that came up with these fantastic stories about a million people being detained in Xinjiang in, in concentration camps. How did they do that? One of them interviewed eight people, as you correctly identified. The other one interviewed 30 people. All right. These people were carefully chosen by people from uh, the Eastern, uh, the independence groups who want to see an Eastern uh, 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 breakaway Turkestan uh, movement. Uh, both movements that they're sympathizing with have been identified by the UN and by the EU as terrorist organizations. So this is what you have. He created these reports. These reports were then uh, referenced by other entities as credible. All right. He's, he works in a foundation of one. It is uh, a license to do technical training in Germany, but does not actually produce any graduates. Basically, it is just a channel that funds him and his far right conspiracy theories. So this is the person who has started these, these series of reports which keep being referenced. His report was referenced by the UN yeah. as source material. It was then referenced by the um, Pentagon, the, then the State Department. The State Department then actually referenced the Pentagon report as saying that that's a credible report, although it was based on this false information. So you have a web of lies, deceit, created by two entities and an individual who's hostile to China. So going through this, is this a fair report? I, I don't think that has any credibility. So the tricky part is I can imagine um, any individual with whatever background or mission or motivation or funding, um, you know, having very strong views against some political ideology doing some kind of report. I can understand that basically, but for, for instance, the Associated Press to make a 18, 19 page investigative report based on such investigation, that is what I cannot understand. Wang Tsung. Well, me as well. Yeah, I'll I know. Get back because to you. Uh, remember, yeah. Uh, yeah, me as well. You know, remember, AP. Uh, this is a very big, uh, credible news agency uh, in the United States. I thought has so. won numerous Pulitzer, Pulitzer Prizes, and also their best is investigation. So when I uh, first uh, read this story, I had I had some uh, you know higher expectations, and that from the uh, you know third or fourth uh, paragraph where they started quoting uh, these people, especially the Adrian Zins uh, report. I know this is a total hatchet job that does not even require uh, the slightest, you know, um, does not have the slightest the credibility because as you so eloquently uh, dismantled in your monologue, 
th there's no uh, no truth uh, in any of those uh, uh, statistics cited. I myself, I want to add a little bit personal touch to this. I myself as a, a, a is a ethnic uh, group from uh, southwest China, uh, and I have three sisters. The, the total in the, in the article they confuse with ethnic minorities and also Uyghurs. There are 55 ethnic groups in China. Uh, you you have to get that straight first if you want to write a piece about ethnic group, uh, uh, you know, uh, family planning or Uyghur family planning because they, they, they didn't make that specific. And also, uh, my problem is, as you mentioned, it's not Adrian Zins. This guy, everybody knows, is a crazy guy with uh, crazy ideas. He's, he's, uh, he's led by God on a mission against China. He says and he is. The problem is, he is, yeah, he stated that. And how uh, a, you know, AP, a, a credible news agency, or as we thought, a credible news agency keep using this guy for a p investigative piece like this. This is, you know, this is beyond my imagination. And also, it's part of the, you know, China-U.S. Uh, relations, you know, wh which is completely in the uh, in the downfall at the moment. Uh, this is part of that, and also the uh, media. Uh, media it played a huge role in where where the China-U.S. relations is. And if there's nothing uh, can be changed or, you know, if they go out of way to use uh, these kind of, uh, this type of reports to dis uh, discredit China or demonize, this is demonize China, then I think the relationship will not improve anytime soon. Not just so demonize, this will yeah, take it's, more it's, um, from China too. It's dehumanized, yeah, so right? This take it's, it's, it's to the extent that's that, right. you know, and, and all, the, all of the words that were used in this article were uh, tilted in a way to make it sound as if there is there there is no single shred of humanity left in this government. That everything they want to do is to ruthlessly crush on the ethnic minorities. You know, it's it's everything done in such a subtle way to point to that kind of impression without actually articulating it. Anna, you wanted to say something just now. Yes, I mean, uh, I, I always find it interesting that uh, last year uh, there were 200 million Chinese tourists, or tourists in general, who went to Xinjiang. So if you were doing this supposedly big cover-up in a ruthless way, why would you invite 200 million people to wander around this area? It's a large area, but surely there would be stories coming back saying that uh, they had noticed something untoward. This year, it's expected that there'll be 300 million tourists, uh, the vast majority, 99% will come from within China because you can't go outside of China because of the handling of COVID-19 by other governments. So, you know, this kind of narrative is, is completely untrue. Uh, it's just something, as they said, to make China the other. Now, if you recall, uh, the only book that we know that uh, Donald Trump keeps by his bedside are the speeches of Ad Adolf Hitler. Now, what did Adolf Hitler do? He tried to create others. He tried to dehumanize people. Yeah. This right. is his way, path to power and keeping it. Yeah. Let's, let's take a look at some comments that we have received. Let's take a look at this one, for instance. Okay, here you go from Jessica Liu. Many negative fake news are just the Western propaganda to demonize China. Most of us can tell the fake from the truth because we have visited Xinjiang many times. We have visited Xinjiang many times and have business partners there. Um, Liu Yiming, your comments. Oh, well, do we have to engage in every lie they created I'd, in the I'd, past? I'd rather not and to. Some... Liu Yiming, I tell you, I worked at 2 o'clock <laughs> last but night I think in the morning. Should. I'd rather not to, you know. I'd rather focus on some real serious discussions about real problems, about, okay, with you can have criticism, right? You can have different opinion, but based on credible analysis and evidence. But not, you know, but again, when, when every other time you have something like this, what are we going to do? What are we supposed to do? I'd, I'd rather not, not talk about this, honestly. Uh, well, Xinjiang has experienced the most stable period for the past four years. And I do not know what these people want. Certainly what they want is not stability and peace. Actually, Xinjiang invited foreign reporters into 
the so-called camps, what we call centers, education centers. And they can have their cameras around and, and, and see what's going on. But sadly, most of them uh, went back home and using none of the footages what they've got in the, in the re-education center. But instead, they went too far to, in, to interview someone from Kazakhstan, someone from Turkey. I mean, what is the point of inviting all the foreign journalists into these centers? Hmm. I wonder too. Well, it's, you know, when people have doubts, when people don't trust you, they are going to keep these doubts uh, for a very, very long time. It's very, very difficult to bust these misperceptions. Um, I do hope that there will be some benefit of the doubt given to the people of Xinjiang, you know, if not to the local government, but to the people of Xinjiang. For instance, in this AP article, um, not another voice, not uh, some different opinion from the local Xinjiang people were given. Do everybody in Xinjiang think and believe in the way that Adrian Zenz believes? Liu Song, uh, Wang Song, very briefly, your observation. Wrap it up, please. Uh, yeah, I think because, you know, all, all this, not just Xinjiang, Tibet, Hong Kong, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, what we have, we have seen is a systematic, uh, I don't know if they're coordinated, but a systematic, uh, uh, you know, a, a campaign, a propaganda campaign uh, against China in, any, uh, in every front. Uh, so what we've seen uh, in Xinjiang or each line, uh, uh, Ms. Liu just asked, should we engage every line that they push? Uh, we have to put it in a more overall uh, the campaign they're, they're pushing against China. And we want to engage them uh, on the more, uh, I think, more overall approach. Because if you want to, uh, if you want to push back all these lines, if you want to, uh, you know, expose all these lines, it will take, you know, more than maybe the entire population and of China. Won't believe, because probably. <laughs> and people won't believe it. That's right. the problem. Yeah. Because they're pushing it, the world to such a polarized world as the United States, inside Absolutely. the United States. So we have to, we have to see it more in a bigger picture and engage them on a more, uh, yeah. more broader okay. approach. Yeah. I hope um, whoever has the possibility, whoever has the opportunity, go and visit Xinjiang and see things with your own eyes. And uh, by the way, CGTN will also produce a very big project this year live from Xinjiang. Hopefully they will bring you a lot of things that you have never imagined, you've never seen or heard of from Xinjiang. So with that, we come to the end of this edition of uh, Headline Buster. I thank my um, panelists, uh, Aina Tang and Liu Ying and Wang Tsung. And I thank you for having joined us and for having participated in our discussion, if you have. I see you next Friday morning at the same time.